Thanks to the uh, organizers giving me a chance to speak here. Um, <clears throat> uh, so yeah, the title was around Juan Lu type theorems, um, but actually I'm I'm going to uh, do things a little bit backwards um, and get to the Juan Lu type theorem sort of his remarks at the end. Uh, so this is uh, this is joint work. Uh, it's very much work in progress. Recent weeks. Um, with uh, Jason Bell and uh, Adam Topaz. <coughs> um, and they're not, they're, 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 we don't yet have the, the optimal results here, and <clears throat> uh, but I hope there's uh, enough to warrant a talk on it. Um, so <clears throat> um, I'm going to start sort of right away into um, the particular uh, result that we recently um, have arrived at um, with a bit of lo local motivation, but then um, I'm going to try to leave time to uh, connect it with um, kind of intriguing an analogy between um, the uh, difference al algebraic and differential algebraic contexts. But um, I'll do that afterwards. <clears throat> so the actual uh, um, statement happens um, very much in a different setting, even though uh, my motivation comes from the differential one. And it, the starting point is a, uh, a theorem of, uh, of Cantat um, on, uh, or Cantat, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, Cantat, uh -huh. Serge, Serge Cantat, uh, um, on uh, uh, rational algebraic dynamics. So, um, <coughs> So I'm <clears throat> going to mean something relatively naive here. So um, <clears throat> I take uh, an algebraic variety. And for simplicity, I'll just take it over the complex numbers. Um, <clears throat> equipped, so by a, a rational algebraic dynamical system, I mean uh, an algebraic variety, uh, say quasi-projective. even affine, if you like, <coughs> equipped with a rational, the birational map. I'll use S to denote the birational map. So this is the, dyna the rational dynamics, because this isn't uh, assumed to be an endomorphism of the variety, but just a, 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 a birational map. So on a Zariski open subset, uh, it's an isomorphism. Um, <coughs> And the uh, objects of study here are subvarieties, which are totally invariant. Um, by which I mean that S inverse of Y equals Y. I'm cheating here a little bit because S is not an endomorphism, it's a birational map. So I really, I'll use this notation. Um, but I really, I don't mean really the pullback. Um, S isn't defined everywhere. Um, so I only am interested in Y, which intersect, um, uh, say, the image of the domain of S. And then I pull it back on that domain, on that Zariski open set. And then I take Zariski closure. So it's really the strict transform. This is just dealing with the fact that S is not necessarily defined everywhere. It's a birational map. Even though I write it as a function, it's not defined on all of X. Um, <coughs> and uh, um, OK, these are the totally invariant um, uh, subvarieties. And the other um, uh, definition I need to give is what it means to, for S to preserve a rational function. So uh, a rational function. Say f uh, on x is preserved if um, if uh, precomposing with s 
uh, pre-composing with S if it's preserved by pre-composition, right? So you know, view, uh, if you like, F is a map to P1, and uh, <coughs> um, I have S, and I'm looking <coughs> at the rational function I get by pre-composing pre uh, with S, and it's preserved in, by this dynamical system if, it, if it's preserved, if it gives you the same rational function. Um, <coughs> And now the theorem uh, of, of uh, Cantat that I'm actually, uh, the way I'm stating it, the context, it's a theorem of Cantat, but it was done at the same time independently in a more special but uh, main case um, by um, Jason Bell uh, Rogalski Sierra, also in 2010. But I'm stating Cantat's version, uh, with where where this is allowed to be birational rather than an automorphism, um, <clears throat> and it says the following: it says that if S does not preserve. Any, uh, it does not preserve yeah, any rational function, any non-constant rational function. Then um, this dynamical system um, has only finitely many In totally invariant hypersurfaces. Right, so that's a necessary condition. If you have a, um, a, a rational function which is preserved by S, then by looking at the level sets of this rational function, you would get hypersurfaces, co dimension one sub varieties of X, um, which would be preserved by sigma. And so this is a kind of converse that if um, uh, there are no such rational functions preserved by this dynamical system, then there are only finitely many totally invariant um, hypersurfaces. This is something in difference algebra because uh, such a birational map is equivalent to looking at an automorphism of the rational function field. Right? So the, the difference field here is the rational function field uh, <coughs> equipped with, uh, uh, with the automorphism induced by S via precomposition. So it's saying that there are no, so no non-constant, of course, it, constant functions are preserved. So it's saying that no non-constant functions are in the fixed field. <clears throat> then it must be because there are few hypersurfaces, finitely many hypersurfaces. Um, let me restate this in a somewhat um, strange way uh, to motivate um, the generalization. So <clears throat> we're given, um, two maps from X to X, S and the identity. And I can state this by saying that if, taking the contrapositive, I can say if uh, X has infinitely many hypersurfaces, Y, <coughs> such that, well, the pullbacks agree, the strict transforms agree. So, uh, I mean, it's a silly way of writing it. The identity inverse of y is equal to s inverse of y. Right? Just saying that it's preserved, s inverse y equals y. <coughs> then, um, there is a non-constant rational function such that the diagram commutes. You can complete the square of the state diagram with f on both sides, right? Because that just says that <coughs> f identity is equal to fs. So, uh, sorry, 
other way, pre-composition, I apply the identity and then f is the same as applying s and then f. So it's just saying f. And so I just, it's just a, it's a trivial restatement, but I want to view it like this. So I have this kind of beginnings of a square, the two sides. If I have infinitely many hypersurfaces which pull back to the same thing, then I can complete the square by non, with a non-constant, sorry, this is not x here. This is, say, p1. View it as a function to p1. It's rational, rational functions map from x to p1. <coughs> is that uh, clear? Restatement of, uh, of this. Um, so let me just state our generalizations motivated by that picture. <coughs> um, and so the theorem that we can prove is that, that this is actually a very, general, a very general situation. So instead of starting with x and the identity and some birational map, you can start with any z and any two maps to some x. So I should say what these are. So um, z and x are algebraic varieties, quasi-projective algebraic varieties over c. Um, and the phi i are um, dominant rational maps. So the rational maps from z to x that are dominant, the image is risky dense, um, with um, uh, generic fibers irreducible. So this is, again, thinking algebraically, is just um, coming from an embedding of the rational function field of x into the rational function field of z. And this generic fibers being irreducible is saying that, that the, the rational function field of x is relatively algebraically closed in the rational function field of z. Okay, so that's the data. And then the statement is, this, is uh, the same if uh, x has infinitely many hypersurfaces, co-dimension one subvarieties, y, <coughs> such that um, phi one inverse of y is equal to phi two inverse of y. Again, I'm taking strict transforms because these are rational maps, not necessarily defined everywhere. So pull back on a risky open set. Uh, then there exists a non-constant function, rational function on x, um, such that um, the square commutes when you put in f on both sides. So phi1 f equals f phi1 equals f phi2. Um, so it's, it's uh, um, a special case is, uh, is uh, Cantat's theorem, um, but now we have uh, a different variety, z, as a source of our rational maps. It can be higher dimensional than x. Um, and um, phi1 and phi2 can be any rational map. So somehow it no longer really looks like a dynamical system, but it is some kind of generalized dynamical system. You can think of Z some kind of correspondence on X, not, not a finite to finite correspondence, but some algebraic relationship between X and itself. It, <coughs> it's um, a variety which maps dominantly onto both. And so in this kind of generalized dynamical system, if you have uh, invariant, infinitely many invariant hypersurfaces, and it's also clear that if you had such an F, then um, that made this commute, then, then um, the level surfaces would be invariant because of the commuting of the square. I have f on both sides, right? So it's not some f and some g, it's the same f that makes the commute. Right? <coughs> so is the statement uh, clear enough, or should I say more? Okay. So I want to give some ideas about the proofs that go into this and then go to where 
this really came from, uh, as opposed to being a generalization of Kanta, it's connected to some other things that are kind of intriguing, but for which we don't have answers. I'll talk about that later. Um, this is something that Jason and I thought about um, about three years ago um, <coughs> for some time. Not exactly the statement, but in relation to the, the differential versions. Um, and, uh, and didn't really get very far. Um, and then um, uh, Adam Topa has included, was, became part of the collaboration. And <coughs> um, recently, there's been uh, um, uh, some progress that led to this, this theorem. And what uh, Adam's idea was that really uh, made the difference here was that is to consider. So let me give, so I don't know if I should call it a sketch or uh, I'll call it a sketch. Maybe it's just some ideas in the proof. So the, the, there's sort of a shift of um, point of view that Adam brought, which was we should consider the following uh, category. So, um, <coughs> so let's take a finitely generated field, K0, subfield. Finitely generated subfield, <coughs> uh, K0. Um, and let's look at the category of objects a category which I'll call V K sub zero, where the objects are pairs X S, <clears throat> um, where X is an algebraic variety over K zero, uh, and S is a set um, of irreducible hypersurfaces. But uh, not necessarily over K0, um, over K0 alg. Uh, maybe I'll use bar over the algebraic closure. So I'm not being very careful here about base change. So X is defined over K0. So really, these are hypersurfaces, base change up to K0 bar. I'll just call it X. Um, and so these hypersurfaces are defined over some the algebraic closure of the finely generated field. <coughs> so that's what the objects look like. Varieties equipped with some collection of hypersurfaces. And what are the morphisms? Um, <clears throat> well, um, it should be a dominant rational map. Uh, say phi from x to x prime, uh, again with generic fibers irreducible. So I have an embedding of their function fields that's such that the, the function field of x prime is relatively algebraically closed. And what should it uh, do with these sets of hypersurfaces? Well, um, if I take the pullback of these hypersurfaces, the strict transforms of them, of S prime, then I don't necessarily get S, but I get something whose symmetric difference is finite. So this is such that. So to be a morphism is not enough to just be a, a dominant rational map from X to X prime, but such that it takes, well, up to finite amount of uh, error, um, <coughs> it pulls these hypersurfaces back to those hypersurfaces. Okay. Okay. <coughs> um, maybe it's worth pointing out that if it, uh, I'm in, in this context with, with irreducible generic fibers, if I take uh, a hypersurface on X prime, um, which you know, has some intersection with the image of the domain of phi, so it, 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 it makes sense to pull it back, then there's a unique uh, hypersurface, irreducible hypersurface that's projecting dominantly onto the one you started with. So, up to removing finally many things, it really gives you a bijection between the hypersurfaces here. Okay. Um, right, so we look at this, uh, um, uh, this category and then the proposition. is that uh, if you're given x, s in this category, 
Then there is a terminal object or a terminal morphism. originating at XS. So not terminal in the whole category, but terminal with respect to morphisms originating in XS. So let me say that explicitly, i.e., um, for any other morphism um, <coughs> XS to say y t inside my category, say psi, I have this one whose existence um, the proposition is asserting, and it'll always factor through any other one. If you're given any other one, then it factors. For any morphism psi, uh, phi factors through. So, <coughs> Fixing a, uh, an object in the category, looking at all arrows out of it, there's a terminal object in that subcategory. Um, <clears throat> notice, by the way, that if, if I started with a finite set of hypersurfaces, I mean, this condition sort of ignores finite sets, so you can throw away finite sets. So then there's a terminal object for sure. You just take the trivial variety, spec of K0, with the empty set of hypersurfaces, and, uh, <clears throat> and that'll be a terminal object. So this is really of all, only of interest when I'm looking at infinitely many uh, hypersurfaces here. Notice that you know, if, if, if there are infinitely many hypersurfaces, the image has to be positive dimensional. This also has to be infinite in order for the symmetric difference to be finite. Um, so maybe I say something about the uh, sketch of the proof of the proposition, and then something about how we get from the proposition to the theory. So at least what I'd like to say about the proposition is what the x prime should be. So it, I mean, it's going to be unique and so on. So there's something canonical that I associate to xs. So let me say something about what this um, uh, x prime uh, will be. So um, let's make, uh, let's suppose, <coughs> um, for simplicity, I'll say a word about the other case. But let's suppose, uh, so this is a. Again, a sketch of proof. So let's suppose um, all um, elements of S uh, are actually over K0. I mean, the category was a bit more general, and we need the general case where they're defined over the algebraic closure. Um, somehow you can, you can do this argument after closing off by the Galois action of k0 bar over k0. So um, <coughs> um, this is already a, a, a main case to, to consider. So now, not only is the variety defined over this finely generated field, so are all the hypersurfaces I'm interested in. And now, what do I do? I look at, um, look at the set of functions, so rational functions. f on uh, over k0 on my variety x, whose support is contained in this set of hypersurfaces. So the, the pole, poles and zeros, which will be co-dimension 1 sub-varieties, all their irreducible components all belong to this set of divisors. Okay, so let's consider this collection of functions. Look at um, uh, the field they generate inside the rational function field of, uh, of x. So this is a subfield of the rational function field of x. And take its algebraic closure inside relative algebraic closure. So let's give this a name. It's called k, double blackboard bold k of s. <clears throat> it's a certain relatively algebraic closed subfield of the function field of x, and hence it's the function field of some variety x prime. Um, <coughs> and the embedding of function fields gives me a dominant rational map. And the fact that it's relatively algebraically closed will give me a, uh, um, uh, the fiber, the generic fibers will be irreducible. Now this S won't necessarily work, but after replacing S 
by a cofinite so subset, which our statements are all um, robust under. We're only interested in things up to up to a finite amount of error. So after replacing S by a cofinite subset, we may assume that uh, if I do this construction with S, I get the same thing as if I did this construction with S0 for any cofinite S0 contained in S. So I've got a minimality. I can reduce S to be minimal just by transcendence degree. So if, there, if it wasn't true, then I'd get a cofinite subset, which gives a smaller but relatively algebraically closed sub uh, um, function field. And I iterate at each stage, the transcendence degree will go down. So they're relatively algebraically closed in each other. Uh, and this has to terminate. Um, <clears throat> because it's a finite transcendence degree field. And so I can get a minimal such S. So I, I've, I've just replaced S by that minimal sub, sub collection. And then this one works. So uh, you let X prime um, <coughs> be such that um, the function field of X prime is this field. It's some function field. It's function field of some variety, and let's call that x prime. Um, now, I, that's an x prime. I have to say what um, uh, um, s is. Well, you just take the image. S prime is. So you let s prime be just the image. So this gives me, right? So this embedding. Sorry, k zero. Of x gives a dominant map, dominant rational map, whose generic fibers are irreducible. Um, and I let S prime be the hypersurfaces I get by looking at the images uh, in X prime. And <clears throat> we need to show that this is a morphism. So, um, and that, yeah, so we need the X, S, by phi to x prime s prime is a morphism in this category, i.e. we need to know that the symmetric difference is, um, uh, of the pullback of s prime on x is finite. And the way, if you think about it a little bit, the only way that can go wrong is that if infinitely many hypersurfaces in s project onto x prime. So they, if they project onto something proper, it'll be co-dimension one. Um, but Maybe infinitely many of them are dominantly projecting onto x prime. So they're not giving me hypersurfaces in the base. But now I use the um, finite generatedness of the, of the divisor class group. So for this, you use the, the class group of x over k0 is finitely generated. <clears throat> OK, to produce a contradiction. So you have these infinitely many divisors. They have to have some dependence inside the divisor class group. Uh, and that gives rise to, um, okay, uh, contradiction. I'm not going to give the details of the argument. It's, it's relatively elementary, but it uses this finite generation, generatedness of this group. Um, <clears throat> so that gives it a morphism, and then the minimal choice makes it the terminal. Yeah, and the minimality and construction uh, imply terminality. There's some things to do here. I'm just giving a sketch. So, um, <clears throat> so it's 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 not um, very difficult, um, uh, but well, it seems sort of at first like a different problem, and this was uh, this is what we were missing. So let me now say a few words about how you get from the proposition to the proof of the theorem. Um, yeah, I did this in a special case, but I, maybe I said something about if they weren't defined over k0, there's a, some Galois action that you have to worry about, but you can carry through the arguments. Um, for how to get from this terminal object in this category to um, this theorem, This is as follows. So the, the idea is to reduce the Cantor's re result. <clears throat> uh, 
In fact, we originally thought we had a, a, a sort of a new proof, and it, it was sort of an immediate corollary of this proposition, but in, in, only in the last uh, week or so realized that it doesn't, that that implication didn't actually work, and it was fixed by, by using Cantat's theorem. So it's a, it's a generalization of Cantat's theorem, but um, not a new proof of Cantat's theorem. Um, <coughs> So how do I get a dynamical system? So um, I mean, I have a dynamical system. How do I get an object in the category? So now I'm in the context of the theorem, right? So I just have the z to x, two maps, and I have infinitely many hypersurfaces that get pulled back to the same thing. <coughs> so let's take um, S uh, to be an infinite set of hypersurfaces. on x such that uh, for all y in S, uh, phi 1 inverse of y uh, is equal to phi 2 inverse of y. And that's the uh, assumption that there exists such an infinite collection. So let's take uh, such an infinite collection. Um, let's, I need a finally generated field, so let k0 be the finally generated, a finally generated field uh, over which all of the data given in the theorem is defined. So z, x, phi1, and phi2 are defined. There's only finally many things to worry about here, and so I have a finally generated field over which those things are defined. Now, of course, I don't know. Um, uh, the S, you know, in the statement, these hypersurfaces are just defined over the complex numbers. So I don't know that they are, I can't, there are infinitely many of them, so I can't get them all to be defined over cases. So it's so sort of two cases. So one case is um, all elements of S are defined over K0. Or K0 bar. It's good enough because our proposition works with K0 bar. So suppose all of these hypersurfaces are defined over the algebraic closure of K0. Then these maps phi1 and phi2 are naturally morphisms in my category where T, where, I have to, where my set of hypersurfaces on Z is just the pullbacks. So I take uh, T, so let T be the pullback of S. I'll just say by phi1, it's the same, right? They all agree. So I could pull back by phi1 or by phi2, and I'll get the same set of hypersurfaces. Let T be that. And now um, um, each of these phi i's, which go from Z equipped with T to X equipped with S, are morphisms. In VK0, because um, well, T was just taken to be the pullback ones. So, and they agree the pullback is equal, pullback of S is T for both of these morphisms, phi1 and phi2. And so I have a diagram from X, from Z, S. I have phi1, it's a morphism to X, S. <coughs> um, and phi2. Ah, sorry, with Z I have T. But I have a terminal object emanating from ZT by the proposition. So by the proposition, I have some terminal Z prime, T prime. So this is terminal. Terminal with respect to ZT. And that means that I get maps this way. So there exists, say, G1 and G2 morphisms in my category going from XS to Z prime T prime, such that this thing commutes. <coughs> and now we apply it one more time. So now look at XS. It has two maps going out of it. So G1 going to Z prime T prime, and G2 going to Z prime T prime. And XS has a terminal object emanating from it, X prime S prime. And so I get H1 and H2. So this is again terminal. But this time terminal for XS. And now from the minimality of, of Z prime T prime, it's a, it's a, 
Uh, it's terminal with respect to maps emanating from here, so you cannot go any further. If you go any further, it'll be an isomorphism. So these maps, H1 and H2, must be isomorphisms. So they're birational maps. And I can, and, G, and G2 then is just G1, H2, H1 inverse. Ah, I should make the numbers match, right? There's G1 and G2 here. So this is H2 and this is H1. G1, phi1, G2, phi2, yeah. And so G2 is just G1, H1, H1 inverse. So let's call alpha to be uh, H1 followed by H2 inverse. So this is a dynamical system on Z prime. It's a dominant rational map, so it's a bimeromorphic map from Z prime to itself. And I have that uh, if I do um, G1 and then alpha, I get G2. And I apply Cantas theorem here. Now, <coughs> If you take anything in T prime, we know their pullbacks agree here because if you take anything in S, their pullbacks agreed here. So by chasing the diagram, it's not hard to see that for all, uh, uh, say, Y in T prime, so this is a hypersurface on Z prime, um, <clears throat> uh, um, if I apply uh, alpha and then uh, if I pull back alpha on Y fixed, you know, just chasing this diagram. I didn't just start with a, uh, I, I knew more than the fact that these were morphisms. I knew that not just that the pullbacks agree as a set, but that element by element, when I pull them back, they agree, right? That's the hypothesis of the theorem, that phi1 inverse of y is equal to phi2 inverse of y. And that leads to the fact that alpha inverse of y is equal to y for y inside z prime. And so this is, satisfies the conditions of, of Cantas theorem. And so, by Cantas theorem, we get uh, a function. So there exists some non-constant f on uh, on z prime, such that uh, if I do um, alpha and then f, then I just get f. It must preserve some rational, alpha must preserve some rational function because it's a dynamical system on Z prime, um, which, uh, um, <coughs> which has infinitely many totally invariant hypersurfaces. And now we just put it together. So let me just draw the diagram together one more time. So I have the first diagram, yeah, from Z. I have, actually, I don't even need to draw it with the things. I just think of the original diagram, so I have a map from Z, phi1 to x, phi2 to x, um, <clears throat> and I have uh, G, G2 going to Z prime, G1, this commutes already from that, from that first diagram there, <clears throat> and then I have a endomorphism of Z, I mean a, a, a birational map of Z prime, so from Z prime back to Z prime, and then I have some uh, Rational function, I think of as a map to P1. Non-constant, so dominant rational function to P1. And I can take this to be my little f. And then it's not hard to see that if I go the other way, so if I do um, f alpha g1, then that's also equal to f just because alpha G1 is G2, right? Alpha G1 is G2, so these, the map to here is the same as the map to here, and then I'm just doing one thing. Right? So this map here is also F. So I've completed the square, I found an F to P1, making the thing commute, okay? Um, there is a case two, um, uh, which is, uh, which I'll say something about which is maybe they weren't defined over the algebraic closure of K0. So this, uh, this proposition really uh, required them to be defined over K0, or, or we could go to the algebraic closure of K0, because the proof used this, right? You need, the, you need the divisor class group to be finely generated, so you have to be working over a finely generated field. 
<coughs> um, so case two, um, there is some y in S, so something preserved by phi 1 inverse y equals phi 2 inverse y, um, defined over a non-algebraic uh, um, uh, finitely generated field uh, L0 over K0. So I'm just looking at one element, so I have some finely generated extension over which it'll be defined, and I'm assuming they're not all defined over K0 bar, so I find one where my L0 is, not, is a non-algebraic extension. And now I can look at the orbit of y. So I can look at automorphisms, say, of L0 bar over K0. <coughs> and the fact that this is defined over L0 and not defined over the algebraic closure of K0 tells me that this orbit is infinite. Say S tilde. So I have an infinite collection of hypersurfaces now defined over L0 bar. <coughs> Um, and um, they still have the property that the pullback by phi 1 and phi 2 agree, because y had that property, and that information was defined over k0, and I'm taking the orbit under the Galois action fixing k0. So it still has that property. <coughs> so this is an infinite collection. So S tilde is an infinite collection of hypersurfaces over L0 bar. Um, satisfying, still satisfying the property that phi 1 inverse of y is equal to phi 2 inverse of y, but now for any, I shouldn't call it y, I should call it y prime, for any y prime in S tilde. In S tilde dependent on y, I started with a y and I took its orbit, I got S tilde, and I'll take anything in that orbit and it still satisfies this property just by an automorphism argument. And so now I can repeat the case 1, but working instead of k0, I work with L0 and S tilde. So now apply case one, but with, instead of S, with this infinite collection S tilde and the finally generated field L0 uh, rather than S and K0. And I get, this, I get an F in the end. So the F in the end may not be defined over K0, right? but the, the statement of the theorem doesn't say that. I just need some complex rational function, and so it, it might have to go to an extension. OK. Um, <clears throat> right. I, it was a little bit quick, but um, hopefully some idea of how uh, this theorem is proved. And now I'd like to go back uh, and talk a little bit, um, uh, maybe in 10 minutes, about uh, a motivation for this which we don't fulfill. I mean, which, which, doesn't, which, which we don't realize, but which um, I think is, uh, is interesting. So maybe I'll keep the statement up. And this is the differential case. So <clears throat> actually, maybe I'll write it here. So, um, differential algebraic analog. So I'm going to be working here now, instead of dynamical systems, we work with vector fields. So let me call them D varieties. So I have a D variety, which is what? It's a algebraic variety X, and not equipped with a birational map but equipped with a section to the tangent bundle. Regular section to the tangent bundle. I'm still working uh, over, over the complex numbers. Right? So at every point in x, it's giving me a direction along the tangent space. And so it's a, ve a vector field on x. Um, <coughs> and I can talk. If I'm given a sub-variety of x, it's d uh, is a d sub-variety or is invariant 
let's say a d sub variety, if when I restrict this section to y, it lands in the tangent space, tangent bundle of y. Principle, it goes to the tangent bundle of x, but I'm invariant for the vector field if the section takes, is, preserves y, takes y into the tangent bundle of y. And uh, um, a derational function on x, well, um, I mean, you can write it down algebraically. It's just a constant point of the differential field where you look at the rational function field of x and look at the derivation that s induces. But I can also do it this way. I can think of it so a rational function is a map to p1, and I have this section to the tangent bundle, and I take the zero section. So I take the zero section on p1 to its tangent bundle, and I ask that this diagram commutes. So a rational function for which this diagram commutes um, is, uh, is a derational function. Maybe it's worth saying algebraically. So I'm taking the function field of x. So S induces um, a derivation, complex derivation, delta on this function field. And I can look at its constants. The superscript delta here means the constant points. And so i.e. F is in here. F is in here. That's what the derational function will be a function, a rational function, which is in the constant field of the differential field <coughs> on the rational functions. OK, and then there's a theorem. This is Rushovsky. 2000. Ah, it's un an unpublished manuscript from 1996. It's based on Joan Lu's theorem, uh, 1975 or 78, uh, <coughs> um, which says that if XS has no non constant derational functions, then it has only finally many um, d hypersurfaces, co-dimension one subvarieties that are preserved by the vector field. It's completely analogous to Cantat's statement. <coughs> and maybe I'll do it here. I can rephrase this as a diagram that looks like this. So let's say I'm working in the affine case, and x is spec r. And I have this derivation on r coming from the section. I can look at um, uh, two maps from r, algebras, algebra maps. So well, these are going to be the algebra maps corresponding to the geometric maps. So I, they should have a different name. Say phi 1 hat, two maps from r to r epsilon bond epsilon squared. You have the map which is just the identity on R, say R plus zero epsilon. That is a complex algebra homomorphism. But you also have phi two to the same algebra, which takes R to R plus the derivative of R times epsilon. And this being an algebra homomorphism is exactly saying that delta is a derivation. And so I get from spec of r epsilon mod epsilon squared. So this is going to be my z. I get two. So this is now a non-reduced scheme. <coughs> but I get two, an affine scheme. I get two maps, phi 1 corresponding to phi 1 hat, which goes to spec r, which is x, and phi 2. And then it's not hard to see that if you look at this, then a restatement of uh, um, Rushovsky's theorem is precisely the existence of an F if there are infinitely many. So I'll write it here. So now this refers to the notation there. So a restatement. If X has infinitely many hypersurfaces, Uh, y, such that scheme theoretically, the inverse of phi 1 agrees with the inverse of phi 2, 
just thinking about this, it's not hard to prove that that says that y is a d subvariety, that y is invariant with a vector field. Then there exists a rational function on x such that if you do phi 1 and then f, it's the same thing as if you do phi 2 and then f. So this restatement here looks a lot. Yeah, you have the same diagram with the z, two maps. You have infinitely many hypersurfaces that get pulled back to the same thing. And you want to say there exists an f sort of explaining it. So it has a very, it's just a formal similarity. Of course, it doesn't, it's not a special case, unfortunately, of our theorem because z for us were really varieties, reduced varieties. We're looking at, um, you know, divisors. Uh, reduced hypersurfaces on reduced algebraic varieties. And here the role of z is being placed, played by spec of our epsilon mod epsilon squared, some, some, something which if you take its reduction, you just get x back again. Everything's happening in the sheaf, in the non-reduced structure. So if one could make this theorem work even more generally for, for more general z's, including, say, non-reduced spaces in some way, I haven't, we haven't really managed to come up with w what the statement should be exactly then it would, it would be a unification of Kanta's result and the Joanlu theorem, or Roshovsky's theorem. Um, as it stands, it's just a generalization in the direction of this, but not somehow not general enough. I mean, on the other hand, this is more special. Z is still the same dimension as x, whereas in our generalization, Z is anything. Uh, and these are very particular phi ones and phi twos here coming from those algebra maps. If I may, can I take two minutes uh, um, to just give another uh, analog of this that is a somewhat, which is also a, um, <coughs> has the same formal feel to it um, in a different category, which maybe also one should try to unify with these. So this is in, uh, in, in, in bimeromorphic geometry. So this is a theorem of Krasnov from 1975. <clears throat> so I take a compact complex manifold. If x has simply no meromorphic functions, no non-constant meromorphic functions, functions, then x has only finitely many hypersurfaces, analytic hypersurfaces, co-dimension one compact complex submanifolds. It's very much of the same flavor. It's saying that you know, if you had a meromorphic function, the level sets would give you co-dimension one sub, uh, sub analytic subvarieties. But uh, of code image one, but <clears throat> the converse is also true. Uh, if you have no meromorphic functions, no non constant ones, you have none of these. And this, in a rather silly way, can be put into this diagram form. You start with x, and you take the identity for phi one, and you take the identity for phi two. And now you're asserting the existence of some f here. So the condition that the pullbacks agree is vacuous because they're, they're both the same function. In fact, they're both identity. And the condition that this commutes is vacuous because it's f, f, and identity, identity. But what does the statement say? It says, if there exists infinitely many hypersurfaces, which pull back the same thing, but that's obvious. So just simply, if there exists infinitely many hypersurfaces, then there's a meromorphic function while well, making this commute. But the, any, simply, there exists some one constant meromorphic function. So the, the, that formal statement is a restatement of Krasnov's theorem. If there exists infinitely many hypersurfaces, then there must exist a meromorphic function. So, so maybe one would want some version of that, not only that handles non-reduced things, but also works in the complex analytic category. Um, though maybe that's, you know, maybe one should just think about these as analogies and not actually look for single statements which specialize. But, uh, but um, on the other hand, maybe this is something that just happens very generally in some category of ringed spaces or something. But anyway. Thanks for your attention.